I would first like to thank the Committee of yeah. Oracles of Innovation for this invitation. Here is my financial interest. The combined correction for hyperopia and presbyopia is an elective indication for corneal multifocal correction surgery. Classic monovision is usually reserved for the surgery of presbyopic myopes. In this presentation, we will see what separates but also brings together these two approaches. Let's begin with an example for which multifocality was not considered satisfactory by the hyperopic presbyopic operated patient. Despite a high gradient of concentric corneal curvatures, the uncorrected distant visual acuity of this eye was 2020, while the uncorrected near vision was just Jagger 8. We can underline to begin with that the actual curvature map is not the best to appreciate corneal multifocality. <clears throat> it is preferable to use the refractive corneal power map, which is produced using a ray tracing technique based on Snell's law. It represents the vergence of the local optical power of the anterior cornea. While we observe a large gradient of curvature between the center and the edges, and the corneal asphericity is prolate, and this corneal surface generates a high rate of negative ocular spherical aberration. What can well explain the poor uncorrected near vision? We can only really answer this question by studying the total refractive power map of the eye, the OPD map provided by the OPD scan instrument. The multifocality of the whole eye is represented in intelligible form for the clinician thanks to a map which represents the distribution of the optical power or virgins within the pupil for a distant target. In the present case, the multifocality relates to a power gradient between low myopia, insufficient for near vision, and moderate hyperopia. The hyperprolate modulation of corneal asphericity is of no use if it is not carried out concomitantly with central myopization. This point has long remained misunderstood by many surgeons in the past. It was long believed that it was enough to manipulate the corneal asphericity to effectively increase the depth of field, and this clinical example is precisely derived from this approach. As shown in the diagram on the right, for an eye rendered emetropic or presenting low myopia, as shown in this clinical example, there is no interest in inducing hyperprolate asphericity, since this will induce hyperopic defocus towards the periphery. On the other hand, one can conceive of interest for an oblate aspherization, which can increase the depth of focus of an emetropic eye. Some surgeons had, however, made the empirical observation that the more they aspherized the cornea by making it more prolate, the more it was necessary to overcorrect hyperopia, that is, enter more diopters to be corrected, than was necessary for restoring an aided far vision. Here is an example of successful multifocality, because unlike the previous example, the refraction is frankly myopic in the central region of the pupil. The hyperprolate asphericity generates negative spherical aberration, which gradually reduces the importance of this central myopization towards the edge of the entrance pupil. Here is another example of effective multifocality for the non-dominant eye. It is not on the corneal topography that one can see it, but on the virgins map, which reveals a zone of central myopization sufficient to induce a good and aided visual acuity for the near, whereas this myopia decreases rapidly towards the periphery of the pupil to improve uncorrected distance visual acuity. When the cornea is highly prolate, the important flattening reduces sufficiently the angle of incidence of peripheral rays to revert the physiological plus sign of spherical aberration, which becomes negative. This makes it possible to conjugate with the retina the rays coming from distant sources which cross the periphery of the cornea and the rays coming from closed sources which cross the central paraxial region of the cornea. Multifocality aims to induce better uncorrected far visual acuity than the classic monovision, 
thanks to the pupillary periphery, which is emetropic. Now, this central region is the one that determines the value of subjective refraction for human eyes. For this reason, it is best to use this approach for the non-dominant eye. This is a point in common with classic monovision. The comparison between the simulated retinal images for a distant target of two non-dominant eyes obtained after classic monovision at the top and monovision with multifocality at the bottom is eloquent. With regard to the dominant eye, a reverse strategy can be implemented. A less prolate or more oblate aspericity is induced to increase the positive circular aberration, which gives the eye a peripheral myopic defocus capable of increasing the depth of focus. Here is an example of a global refractive map of a dominant eye operated on to improve distance vision. The refraction is under the influence of the paracentral virgin's values and is therefore emetropic postoperatively. But the periphery is slightly myopic to extend the depth of field towards the intermediate vision. But let's come back to the characteristics present in the non-dominant eye after corneal multifocal surgery. Beyond the marketing efforts to differentiate these strategies, they all have a common base. In all these techniques, the zone dedicated to near vision is in the center, it's a myopic area, and the zone dedicated to far vision is on the periphery, as confirmed on these virgins maps. In classical monovision, the difference is that the myopic era is distributed over the entire pupillary surface. In all these techniques, the ocular wavefront analysis will show an increase in negative spherical aberration. Current examer lasers do not make it possible to deliver corrections with a dioptric gradient. They do not make it possible to modulate the rate of spherical aberration either. However, some platforms allow the induction of a particular corneal aspericity. The surgeon must either rely on a black box or determine which aspericity to induce to obtain the correct optical gradient. We have carried out work aimed at determining the optimal rate of circular aberration to induce a power gradient with central myopia and rapid degradation of myopia in the periphery. For this, it is necessary to convert the phase error into dioptric error. We then realized that for a 6 mm pupil, a negative spherical aberration wavefront error of 0.4 microns for a 6 mm pupil, shown here in orange, induces a power variation of about 2.5 diopters between the center and the edges of the pupil. This is shown here in blue. Hence, on a non-dominant eye, to fully benefit from a 2.5 diopters addition with multifocality, the surgeon has to target a refraction of minus 2.5 postoperatively and alter the Q to get a variation of 0.4 micron of spherical aberration. The next challenge is to determine which asphericity change is necessary to change spherical aberration by an amount of minus 0.4 micron on a 6 mm pupil. We have published these results in the GIRS, and the answer is that a change of about minus 0.6 for the Q value toward increased prolateness would work for most positive 
hyperopic and presbyopic power correction. Results of this approach have been published, and we have shown that compared to classic monovision, we had better uncorrected near with the dominant eye and better uncorrected distance with the non-dominant eye. This approach has been implemented since in the EX500 excimer laser under the read correction option. The read option concerns the presbyopic, emetropic, or hyperopic eye and allows the planning of the non-dominant eye specifically. The read option enables the surgeon to program the laser accordingly on the non-dominant eye to achieve what is necessary to gain near vision and gain more uncorrected distance vision than <coughs> with classic monovision. The use of the read treatment module automatically generates an addition for near vision, which is added to the correction of hyperopia for far vision, as well as an optimized variation for the asphericity of the cornea, previously measured with a topographer connected to the laser. In conclusion, the difference between a monovision and multifocal correction technique on the non-dominant eye concerns the extent of the myopic refraction zone in the pupil. It is extended to the entire pupillary zone for monovision techniques and restricted to the center of the pupil for multifocal techniques as shown here on these real-life examples. For the dominant eye, the same principles, but reversed, can be applied to induce emetropic refraction, but increase the depth of field thanks to the peripheral mild myopization. In all cases, it appears that to induce a useful depth of focus, it is necessary to induce a selective myopization of the center for the non-dominant eye or of the edges for the dominant eye. I recognize that this finding is less exciting than the generic names of presbyopia correction modules promoted by laser companies. With this presentation, I hope to have demystified the principles involved in corneal multifocality in presby LASIK and shown its relationship to monovision. I thank you for your attention.